Hi, welcome to another Cold Fusion video. You can't mention the word PC without thinking of Microsoft. Originating as a competitive startup in the 1970s, the company took over personal computing in the 90s. So that's the new Windows 95 interface. Simpler, far more intuitive, not without a few problems though, but in general, a great improvement. Microsoft is now worth about 750 billion US dollars, making it the fourth most valuable company in the world. Perhaps just as well known as the four window logo is the company's philanthropist founder, Bill Gates, whose $90 billion net worth makes him the second richest person in the world. Things may look crazy now, but at one point, Bill Gates was hated by the public and Microsoft was being sued by the US government for breaching antitrust laws. The story of Microsoft and Bill Gates is one of incredible genius, controversy, as Microsoft tried to take over the world. So just how pervasive is Microsoft? And how did it all start? And what are some interesting facts about the company? Sit back and relax, and I'll tell you all about it in this video. You are watching Cold Fusion TV. Bill Gates was born in 1955 in Seattle. As a child, he enjoyed playing Risk, a world domination game, and Monopoly, a game where players in a pseudo-economy crush their opponents financially. These games perhaps natured a competitiveness and ruthlessness in Gates, which he later brought to the business world. From an early age, Gates was fascinated with computers. In the 1960s, when Gates was in high school, microcomputers were starting to take off and were some of the first computing machines available to the public. While expensive to the common person, microcomputers were far cheaper than the large mainframe computers used by universities and large organizations at the time. One of the first microcomputers, the PDP-8, cost around 150,000 US dollars in today's money. Gates, along with future co-founder Paul Allen and a few other friends, would learn to code by renting time on corporate microcomputers. Gates and his gang were discovered to be exploiting bugs in the computer's code to obtain free additional time. When the company found out, they struck a deal with the boys and actually hired them to search and fix bugs. Back at school, Gates was so far ahead of the curve that the school let him build their class scheduling program. Coincidentally, the program assigned the young Gates to no classes on Fridays and classes with a disproportionate number of girls on the remaining days. The future was bright for Gates, who was said to have an IQ over 160. The story of the Microsoft company starts in 1974. Bill Gates was studying at Harvard at the time when his childhood friend Paul Allen showed him a new DIY microcomputer called the Altair 8800, which was featured on the cover of a magazine. The computer was dumb even by standards of the day. All it could do was flash some lights. But Gates immediately realized that with some strong software, the rudimentary machine could become an affordable personal computer for anyone to use. Gates's insight caused him to drop out of law school so that he and Allen could start a software company just for this purpose. Logically, they named the company Microsoft, which was software for microcomputers. Allen and Gates phoned the company which produced the Altair 8800 computers and told them that they had software written for the machine. There was only one problem though. At this stage, they hadn't even written the software yet. All they had was a company. Because this article um, received immense uh, interest. I mean, the idea of a kit computer, even though there was really nothing you could do with it. In the early days, it's pretty useless. People just bought it thinking that it would be neat to build a computer. And it was kind of, in a way, you know, good news, bad news. Here was someone making a computer around this chip in exactly the way that uh, Paul had talked to me and, you know, we thought about what kind of software could be done for it. And it was happening without us. We wrote these, this company immediately. Two months of sleepless nights and caffeinated drinks later, they would have a meeting with the MITS company to showcase their work, despite only relying on a book from a microchip manufacturer and not even having an Altair machine to test their code on, Gates and Allen were successful at the project. Because we'd never had the chip, just the book from Intel, if we'd made any mistake in terms of how the instructions worked, it never, the thing never would have run. And so Paul was scheduled to fly out to Albuquerque. He decided to go get some sleep. I stayed up all night reading the book to see if we miscoded some of the instructions and finally decided it was all okay, punch out the paper tape and made sure Paul got that before he went off on his plane. He wrote the bootstrap loader, that is the thing you have to key in to make this computer smart enough to know to go get data off the uh, 
teletype to read it into memory. He wrote that on the plane on the way out. Uh, it was actually 46 bytes, the first one. I eventually wrote one in, in 17 bytes, but anyway. And he typed in a program, you know, print 2 plus 2, it worked. He had to print out squares and sums and, and things like that. And he and Ed Roberts, the head of this company, sat there, and they were amazed by, you know, that this thing worked. I mean, Paul was amazed that that our part had worked and, and Ed was amazed that his hardware worked and that here it was doing something even useful. Yeah, this was the first real piece of software ever written for a PC. It came for the first generation of PCs, the thing that unlocked the power that was there. The makeshift code would be the humble start of a revolution. Soon people were using Altair machines to process Word documents and play games. Microsoft was in business. Following the Altair success, Microsoft would go on to provide operating system software for IBM computers in the 1980s for a one-time fee of $50,000. Critically, Microsoft held onto the rights for this software rather than signing it over to IBM. This allowed them to gain royalties not only for each license sold on IBM machines, but also for software sold on other PC manufacturing companies, which were beginning to form at this time. Such shrewd thinking caused the IBM deal to be called the greatest deal in history and made Microsoft a big player in the industry. Sadly, this did come at the cost of Gary Kildall, a losing player in the deal who ended up spiralling into depression and an early death. I've already covered this story, so I'll leave a link below if you want to watch it. As a result of the deal, Microsoft and Bill Gates became synonymous in this new age of personal computers. In the early days, Microsoft also worked with Apple to create software for Apple's hardware. In fact, Gates featured on the Macintosh 1984 promotional video. The development of Macintosh by Apple has been paralleled by the work of leading software developers. It's a great machine. It's a, a step forward in terms of uh, the way it uses graphics and the speed. And uh, I was enthused. We're planning that over half of our retail sales next year will come from, from Macintosh software. The rivalry between Microsoft and Apple only started later that year, when Gates announced plans to make a competing graphical interface operating system. This was inspired by his time working at Apple. Jobs blasted Gates, accusing Microsoft of theft, and later filing a lawsuit, even though it was Xerox, not Apple, that originally developed the graphical operating system. The relationship between Apple and Microsoft is actually a complicated one. In fact, Microsoft would go on to save Apple from bankruptcy in 1997, and the reason they did so is just as interesting as the fact that they did. Flashback to 1986, and Microsoft was riding a fame wave, having just released their Windows operating system, followed by their Office suite. Microsoft's IPO would go on to create three billionaires and approximately 12,000 millionaires. By the mid-1990s, Microsoft would land in hot water. In 1994, the US Department of Justice filed a statement saying that Microsoft had been engaging in anti-competitive behavior. The company was bullying PC manufacturers to pay Microsoft a licensing fee, not only when Windows operating systems were installed, but also when a competitor's software was installed. The Department of Justice was represented by David Boyes, the same lawyer who would go on to represent the medical startup fraud, Theranos. The pressure was building at Microsoft as the investigations continued. At this time, Gates was not at all a philanthropist and was generally disliked by the public. Who was at this executive staff meeting? Probably members of the executive staff. I went through the chain of logic that explains that to you. I, I don't know if you misunderstood some part of it. Well, all I'm trying to do is get your answers on the record because if I begin to tell you what I think about your answers, we'll be here all day. <laughs> Meanwhile, Apple was on the brink of bankruptcy with only 90 days of cash left. In 1997, Jobs announced that Apple would enter a partnership with Microsoft, much to the dismay of fans at Macworld. We're gonna be working together on Microsoft Office, on Internet Explorer, on Java, and I think that uh, it's gonna lead to a, a very healthy relationship. So. And uh, I happen to have a special guest with me today uh, via satellite downlink. And uh, if we could uh, get him up on the stage right now. Microsoft was stepping to save the day, giving Apple $150 million in exchange for shares, an agreement where Microsoft Office would be included on every Mac for the next five years. But this move also helped Microsoft appear to help their competitors rather than illegally bully them. 
Microsoft would settle in 2004, with the judge calling Microsoft an abusive monopoly. Once it was all over, Gates sold all of his Apple stock. Microsoft spent the 2000s as a household name. However, the stock price remained relatively stagnant. Gates and his wife Melinda launched the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in 2014, and Bill would make the foundation his full-time project. Gates pledged to give away 95% of his wealth in his lifetime. Needless to say, Gates' philanthropy won him many supporters in the general public. Although Gates has invested in efforts for Alzheimer's disease, poverty, famine and global health, the foundation has faced some criticism over some of the other causes that it donates to. Gates' current quest is to reinvent the toilet, challenging researchers and companies to invent cheap, sanitary toilets for the developing world. Perhaps one day, Microsoft will just be a small footnote in the life of Bill Gates. So just how big is Microsoft today? Though the market share of their operating system has slowly been declining, an astonishing 75% of PCs still run Windows. In 2018, Microsoft's revenue was 110 billion US dollars. That's enough to give every person in the world around $14.30. If Microsoft was a country, it would be the 37th wealthiest and 193rd most populated. Microsoft owns Skype, GitHub, Bing, Hotmail, Xbox, LinkedIn, and Nokia. Microsoft also has substantial investments in Uber, AT&T, Facebook, just to name a few significant buy-ins, and is looking to grow more. Since Gates stepped away from a full-time role at Microsoft, its stock price has grown almost exponentially, doubling in a five-year period. This is largely due to the company's rebirth under the new CEO, Satya Nadella. Nadella oversaw the acquisition of LinkedIn, which unlike the $7 billion Nokia acquisition, is considered a far greater success. Satya Nadella also eased the rivalry with Apple, announcing in 2014 that Office apps would become available on iOS and Android. Microsoft has also launched their range of Surface laptops and other hardware. The company is diversifying and getting its fingers in a lot of pies. It has recently made acquisitions in video games, virtual reality, cloud computing and artificial intelligence. Windows 10, released in 2015, has just passed 800 million users, becoming the company's most popular operating system, and it's installed on 40% of PCs globally. Microsoft's HoloLens 2 is pitted to be an augmented reality game changer, allowing for a potential great change in the way that we work and learn. Microsoft Azure is the second largest cloud services provider. Microsoft Edge, the younger brother of Internet Explorer, is also trying to dent the web browser market, and it looks promising in gaining some users back from Google Chrome. With all of this being said, a lot of the Microsoft businesses helping to grow the stock price were actually in place before Satya Nadella took over. So while Nadella has overseen the drastic change, his contribution to it must be taken with a grain of salt. Okay, so before we round out the video, let's take a look at some interesting facts about Microsoft. During the early years of Microsoft, Gates was arrested twice while driving without a license. His mugshot later became the silhouette for the default 2010 Outlook profile avatar. Microsoft's company grounds was littered with bunnies after someone supposedly left a bunch of unwanted pets on campus. Other reports say that it was a prank. Either way, the rabbits multiplied and now they're part of the company. Microsoft beat Apple to the smartphone back in the early 2000s. However, the project never really took off for Microsoft. Microsoft passed on the opportunity to buy YouTube for $5 million in 2006. They left the opportunity wide open for Google to purchase them six months later and turn it into the internet's most popular video hosting service. If you type in the text equals rand.old with the open and close bracket into Word and hit enter, it spits out the phrase, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, which contains all letters of the alphabet at once. An investment of $21 in Microsoft in 1986 would have turned out to be $15,000 by 2018. Microsoft employees must bring in M&Ms to share for their work anniversary, one pound each for each year that they've been a company. Bill Gates and childhood friend Paul Allen had already founded one business together in high school before Microsoft. It was called Trafodata, and as the name suggests, it managed traffic data. If it were up to Bill Gates, we may have been calling Windows Interface Manager. Thankfully, some people at marketing thought Windows sounded better. Microsoft began manufacturing hardware in 1983, beginning with the Microsoft Mouse. 
Before marrying Bill Gates, Melinda worked at Microsoft on a product called Bob. It altered the user interface to appear as if you're clicking through a house. The aim was to make computing more inviting to those not familiar with it. Needless to say, it was a failure. Microsoft has over 10,000 patents and applies for about 3,000 more each year. The Bliss background photo is perhaps the most viewed photo in history. Synonymous with Windows XP, it's bound to bring back some memories. So that was an interesting look at the history, size, and some fun facts about Microsoft. It's interesting because analysts warned that by losing Gates to a part-time advisor role, the company would struggle. His presence and the founder mentality he brought were thought to be too important. But in 2019, this couldn't be further from the truth. Microsoft is a long shot from its beginnings as a simple software company. Over the last 43 years, it's diversified and grown into a multinational that doesn't look to be slowing down anytime soon. Let me know your thoughts on Microsoft below. Thanks for watching, this has been Dagogo and you've been watching Cold Fusion. If you want to know more about that battle between Bill Gates and Gary Kildall and why Gary ended up sadly dying, I'll leave a link to that video below. Alright, so I'll see you again soon for the next video. Cheers guys, have a good one. Cold Fusion, it's new thinking.